Welcome to Around the Farm. I'm your host, Clint Chaffer, and that's Chaffer like the rear end of a combine. And we're going to be talking about all things ag. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself and introduce the podcast and what we're going to be discussing uh, over all these different episodes. So myself, I come from a farm in uh, northwest Illinois where we farm 1,100 acres corn and soybeans. I'm also an active climate field view employee. I've been with climate for about uh, four and a half years. You may have listened to the Field View podcast in the past. This is a new version and, a, and is a reboot uh, where we've updated the format and the approach. You'll hear more of the ag topics that are on your mind, and we'll be talking to a lot of ag experts for different points of views and perspectives. But we're also going to have a lot of fun along the way. We'll bring in new episodes each season. With me today is Brian Boak, a fifth-generation farmer from Seton, Illinois, who's going to be talking about his experience in farming and going through some of the the trials and tribulations of the fall of 2018 and how that impacts a lot of his decisions moving forward into, into the spring of 2019. Not only does he farm, but he also runs a soil sampling and consulting business called M3 Ag. Welcome, Brian. Uh, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, Clint. Thanks for having me. Um, so, yeah, I grew up on a farm, went to college for farm management uh, with an agronomy minor. I've stuck around the farm pretty much my whole life. I took a job as an agronomist for a little bit in north central Illinois and decided to move back home and give farming a go. And I've been doing that for about 12 years. I've started a soil sampling business consulting company trying to help people make more money, trying to capture a little bit more profit off the farm, especially the way the last few years have gone, every extra dollar kind of counts. Yeah, and when you talk about home, that's uh, that's Seton, Illinois. I mean, uh, one of the one of the fun things about having Brian uh, on the show is Brian and I, of course, uh, grew up two miles from each other. So uh, again, thank you for uh, for joining us here today. So yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, Seton probably does not ring a lot of bells with many people when thinking about Northwest Illinois. That's not a very densely populated area. <laughs> that's that's for sure. So we're going to talk about, you know, last fall, Brian, and really just some of the some of the issues that we had last fall when it came to harvest and then, of course, the the weather transitions that, uh, that happened uh, after harvest. Uh, just to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that, that, that happened last year and, you know, kind of moving into how that impacted some of your decision making over the over the course of the winter. Yeah, so right around Labor Day, we'd got a pretty large storm there, and I sure hate to complain too much because there was a lot of people in significantly worse shape than what we were. Uh, We got in the field in September, harvest started great, things dried down terrific, and thought we were really going to get after. I thought actually it would be a very early fall, and then uh, about the 3rd of October, it started raining, storms. The river, we were right on the Mississippi. The Mississippi had kind of started raising, flooding, uh, middle of September, never went down. All these rains we got, we couldn't get water to get away from anything and it just started to turn into a nightmare and we went from this pretty good fall this quick start to a snail's pace we were out of the field at one point for 13 or 14 days which is the longest i remember ever being out in fall in one stretch and that just really slowed everything else down it really put the kibosh to a lot of tillage work there's a lot of tillage work not done there's a lot less anhydrous than normal there's I think a lot of the fertilizer got on, but not near as much of the strip till in the area that normally gets done, got done. So it just really turned into a very long and agonizing fall for quite a few people. You know, I mean, uh, you, you talked about the the tillage and the and and anhydrous not getting put on, and a lot of times before that has to be done, the the soil sampling needs to uh, needs to occur as well. Uh, how did the how did the fall impact your your fall sampling? Um, yeah, so actually we ended up, uh, I deal with some guys in the bottoms right along the Mississippi and some very heavy black soils. I'd kind of recommended to them if it was me, I don't know that I would spend my money right now. Uh, sometimes we question results and I don't think there's any reason to put any more variability into um, a subset or something we're going to be making quite a bit of dollars of decisions off of than what we need to. Um, I think we should try to get as good a data as possible and even collecting soil samples not in those areas turned into a problem on trying to do it correct and make sure you were doing a good job or felt good about it. A lot of the errors in soil sampling comes in the collection process and the handling, so it's very important to make sure that you're cognizant of what's going on there. I'm sure a lot of your customers and, and probably you as well, you know, use that information to, to help make decisions throughout the winter time. you know, to kind of get set up in 2019. How has that ended up changing your decision-making process, you know, and what other types of data have you ended up using to, to maybe offset some of that, that that you weren't able to collect? 
Yeah, so a lot of times, uh, depending on the person, um, the, some people pull soil samples every year, some do it every four. Every farm's a little bit different, and people, how they view and think about soil sampling is a little bit different. So for somebody who samples every year or every other year, maybe we're still using some averages from the last couple years, um, and for the guys or gals doing it every four years, that gets to be a little bit more of a challenge. You start to rely a little bit more on yield data and some things that way. You you know, you kind of start going into some, I, I used region reporting, uh, field view region reporting quite a little bit last year to pick out areas and kind of start to go trials that way where normally we would stop and weigh trials and do things and we got into almost Thanksgiving and we got winter storms coming and maybe weigh wagons weren't used quite as much last year as what we usually like to for data collection. So we relied more on technology than I would say we normally do. Yeah, and, and and when you talk about relying on some of that technology, what are what are some examples of uh, you know that some of that technology that we that you would use to to help make uh, make that a little bit easier? Yeah, so a lot of times we like to go ahead and use average results of soil samples from multiple years instead of putting one year at a premium or one result as a premium just to make sure that if that result is not quite perfect that we're not placing a ton of emphasis on there. So. I used uh, the Climate Field View app last year quite a little bit in fall to circle trials, the region reporting, and that kind of helped me come up with some decisions, some averages, things to go off of. It's easier on something on there. You can do it on the fly and be right there. It's nice to sometimes bring some data back into a desktop and really clean and filter and do some of that, but we don't always have that luxury in fall if we're really getting down to crunch time. Sometimes you just got to make with the best information that you have and go from there. Yeah, and, and you know, when we look at not being able to get some of the, the tillage done and, and not being able to get the anhydrous on, um, how has that impacted, you know, what fields that you're going to, to handle differently next year? How, you know, maybe it's a different crop or the crop rotation that you're going to end up changing. Uh, you know, maybe it's a, a hybrid change. Uh, how has that impacted, you know, those decisions moving forward in 19? I think it's something that we really need to be paying attention to um, from a hybrid standpoint. A lot of times our racier horse type hybrids, the stuff that a lot of people really like to talk about, maybe don't handle disease the best. And a lot of that can come from residue. There's some guys that have been thinking about switching to no-till that maybe don't have a choice now. They're going to try that if they want to go some corn on corn. Um, Spring tillage a lot of times doesn't make people feel real warm and fuzzy on the inside. There's density changes in the soil, we have lots of issues that can arise from that. So there'll be some things tried this spring. It'll be a trying spring no matter what. I hope March turns out to be pretty good weather. I hope things turn well um, so we can get in the field and start breaking down some residue with all the rains. I know I've heard different agronomists talk about this kind of common. John McGillicuddy especially talk about, you know, we had a lot of rain. Don't be surprised if we start seeing sulfur deficiencies early next spring, even on uh, pretty good organic matter soils. It's not going to be uncommon. We flushed a lot of that sulfate, the available to the crop, through the profile. So little things like that are probably going to become more noticeable in 2019 than what we've seen maybe in past years. And, you know, I mean, one of the interesting pieces is not only did we have a pretty interesting fall, but this winter so far has been uh, been pretty interesting, at least here in the here in the Midwest. So, um, you know, from extreme cold temperatures to a lot of moisture, uh, how, how do you think that that has, you know, affected some of these, these fields and, and conditions out there? I think, especially on the temperature-wise, I was really surprised after we went through January and we had some extreme cold there for a while, lots of snow, lots of storms. I was surprised a few days after following some moisture probes that I follow through central Illinois and different places. A lot of that really cold time frame, even at four or six inches, the soil was only down to 22 or 24 degrees, which isn't overly cold, you know, when we were talking negative 40, negative 50 degree wind chill temperatures and negative 20 or 30 actual temperatures. So I think as we move later and we get a little more frost, I think that's good. There's a lot of different ideas as far as insects go and frost and freezing, and and uh, I don't know that I'm going to debate anybody on that. There's a lot of smart people that choose both sides, but I think the more frost we can get, the better, but I'm sure tired of winter. <laughs> I think uh, that speaks for a speaks for a lot of us, you know. I mean, uh, like everybody is uh, pretty pretty wiped out uh, after this winter here. So, you know, I mean, uh, going into the spring, uh, looking at 
needing to get nitrogen on, needing to get uh, maybe some soil samples and whatnot. W- what's what's the plan? What do you what do you plan to do uh, this spring to to try catching back up? You know, or or is there such a thing of catching back up at this point in time? I don't know. There's too many things that you can't mimic over winter. A lot of times when we do tillage uh, over winter, we have where our soil density layers where we've changed our tillage. Uh, they will get a little bit back more even. Roots will grow through them a little better. In the spring when you do that, you can hit those density layer changes and roots. If you get into difference in moisture on profiles, roots a lot of times don't like to percolate down through there. Um, On the residue side, it's not going to surprise me if it takes maybe a little more spring nitrogen here on some of these heavier residue fields where we haven't broke down to, to get that carbon to nitrogen ratio so we can get going there may be some guys that do a weed and feed broadcast to UAN, think about maybe another 20, 30 pounds of, of nitrogen. And even if you're strip tilling or anything else, if there's plenty of residue, we got to be thinking about that as we're going out into the field trying to... 2018 was a tough year. It ended up really tough, and we're kind of starting 2019 behind the gun. But we need to be thinking about what we can do in April to give ourselves the best position to be successful in September. Yeah, and and you know, with, with you being a farmer, I mean, what is what are those steps that you're taking right now just to get prepped to to hit the field? Right. Uh, I mean, so one thing I've done more this year than normal is try to find different nitrogen sources. So instead of anhydrous is very common in our area, right, wrong, or indifferent. You know, there's a lot of fall anhydrous. There was a fair amount that got on, especially around the Christmas time frame. We got a little window that quite a bit went on, but there's still a fair amount not there. So. We've been looking at different sources, AMS, finding a mix of uh, ammonium nitrate and AMS, thinking about using more UAN, um, kind of going that way more than I've probably ever done before, and thinking about more about, hey, banding, do we start looking at some more options of why drop with multiple nutrients and earlier than we're, or later than we're used to, you know, it's trying to figure out all these little things and then deciding what the cost is and trying to determine return on investment has been uh, challenging. I mean, it's fun. It's like anything else. There's never the same year over. So I think you need to adapt and try to figure out what's best for you or try to put yourself in the best position that you can to succeed. You know, and and one of the things I know that uh, we were talking about uh, before the show was, uh, you know, last year, you just talk about uh, talk about ROI and, and how that uh, impacts your decision making, you know, moving forward. But you were telling me about a situation last year where you had uh, some some late planted soybeans in a field due to due to some other circumstances that ended up getting hit by hit by frost. And uh, and I'd like you to talk about that, of how that impacted you emotionally, you know, I mean, and uh, and also how that impacted you financially then as well. Yeah. So it was a. Uh unforeseen circumstances and unfortunate circumstances, uh, but that's kind of sometimes just the cards that were dealt. You know, you got to play them. I had some beans that actually looked pretty good kind of for what they were, and then about R5, R5 and a half, they got hit by a killing frost and just really zapped the yield out of them, especially higher areas of the field. Um, and unfortunately on some of that, I, I wasn't able to take insurance for different reasons and circumstances with it. So you go as a young farmer kind of trying to get started and you you go into this and you it turns into a, a kind of a financial nightmare, actually. You start questioning what you're doing. You know, for 32 years, this is the only thing you've ever wanted to do. And now you start thinking, am I making the right decisions? Am I doing the right things? Um, with the trade war, with all the stuff going on, there's there was so many things in 18 that got tough. For, for a lot of growers, I think... 98 resonates with a lot of people because of the hog crisis and the 80s resonates with a large demographic of farmers, just people that survived. And for me, that'll be 2018 going forward. You know, it was the year that you just got to keep going. You got to keep moving, keep chugging, keep trying. Um, It's it's not a great feeling. You know, it gets you a little pessimistic. It gets you down in the dumps and it's good to talk to older farmers and guys that made it through the 80s. And I've had a lot of people that have been terrific to me as I've, it's not real fun to talk about. It's not something I talk about a lot, but it's been great talking to older guys, kind of having a, a connection, maybe one you don't really want to have, but it it, uh, it makes you appreciate things a little more. It makes you excited for 19, excited to start over. That's always the best part of farming. You know, every spring you get to start over. You got your another shot. It's a new chance at life. You got all these cool things that happen in the springtime with the warm up and you get rain and you got tree. I mean, it's just a terrific time of year. So yeah, it's, it's hard thinking that the only thing you've ever wanted to do may be something that just sets you back completely. It's, but 
that's kind of you just got to keep chugging. You just keep going and keep plugging forward. Has that impacted the way that you look at your, you know, finances moving forward into 2019 as opposed to, you know, maybe in, in 18, you know I mean? Oh, has certainly. That, has yeah. that perspective um, changed? I would say return on investment. Well, it's always important, you know I mean? But when you start getting down to, okay, I, I need to do this or I have to do this, it kind of starts putting some things into perspective on why maybe some of those guys, you didn't understand why they made some decisions they did. They, okay, they've been here. They've done these things. You got to make some tough choices, uh, You've got a lot of relationships with people in the industry, you know, that sell a product or sell seed or sell fertilizer. And sometimes you got to make choices, you know, that are the most important for your business. And it may not be in their best interest. And you, it stinks, you know. You don't like to hurt people's feelings or let people down or anything like that. But sometimes you just got to do that, you know. You just got to... Survive in advance. Survive in advance. It's what are what are some of the tools, Brian, that uh, that you're going to use in 2019 to to help make some of those decisions to make sure that you are getting that ROI and make sure that you are putting you know putting the right material down and the the right seed, fertilizer, chemical. Uh, what are some of those tools that you're going to use to to help make those decisions? And that what we're all after the four R. You know, soil health. There's all these great buzzwords in ag right now, and I think they're all terrific. I think the tough part is making sure that we do find return on investment in them. And we, you know, it's it's tough if you haven't tried something on your farm to think about how much do I scale this? Do I do I take this up? Um, I, an iPad is becoming an everyday part of, you know, I take that everywhere. A lot of guys take briefcases with them. I take an iPad with me. You know, it's, if I can do it on my phone, that's great. But an iPad is handy. So Anything I can get on the iPad to help track, because I'm tracking GDUs, so I'm doing tissue sampling throughout the year. I'm trying to monitor crops. I'm, I'm pulling soil samples before the year to see what we got, you know, maybe checking some nitrate levels, seeing what's available. So as we go in and we start thinking about, you know, okay, I'm going to go in. When I go into plant, you know, one of my best things I have there is I got my iPad. I got my 2020. I'm going to run. I'm going to set up. Everything through there, I'm going to log to my iPad. I'm going to run through field view that way. And as I go through the year, I can track my trials. I can track what I'm doing. So that way, if I want to say, hey, I don't know, under irrigation, maybe maybe anhydrous at V4 is paying me better than a Y drop at a V8. Well, it makes some of those things easier to track as we can start data dumping things into one source being able to track it, and then as we get back in the fall, think about coming back to that same location, pulling our yield right over it, and being able to start doing some region reporting. Yeah, are you doing uh, Are you doing any variable rate planting on your farm? Yeah. So, you know, some people swear by variable rate, and other people can't understand at all why you would do it. And I, I get it. Central Illinois versus Northwest Illinois. You know, we go from some very light soil types, some two or three CECs with a half a percent organic matter up to a 30 CEC with five and a half percent organic matter in three or four miles. So, and thinking about that, variable rate applications pay huge for us, especially on the seeding side on the lighter soils because we're usually water limited. We may get enough water throughout the growing season, but if you don't have irrigation, you can't control when that comes. So, We'll plant hybrids on dry land, you know, as low as fifteen, sixteen thousand, and as high as thirty-five, thirty-six thousand, depending on the hybrid and the place. Oh. And then we kind of try to hot check, cold check that. You know, we'll run anywhere from two to four thousand lower or higher in strips next to it, and try to start to determine: Are we doing the right thing? You know, and if I knew how much sunshine we'd have this year, it'd, it'd be a lot easier to start to get some of those things down. But you're you're just always trying to hit a moving average and trying to play your odds. If you can do something 70%, 75% of the time and be successful, that's going to, I'm going to tell you, that's one of the highest ROI things you can do on the farm. If you can be over 70 or 75%, not many things pay that well regularly. I'll tell you what, if you could determine the sunshine that uh, we were going to have throughout here, you wouldn't be stuck in this booth with me right now. That is, so. that is very true. That is very true. <laughs> No, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, just with the variable rate side of looking at organic matter and CECs, which wraps back into the into the soil sampling and the importance of uh, having that data layer as well. Um, what's your what's your advice to farmers, you know, that you're going to be working with uh, that didn't get the sampling done this fall? And are you going to be trying to pull those cores this spring or are we holding off until next fall? What's, uh, what's the plan, plan of attack? That's kind of a million-dollar question. You know, there's a lot of people that will swear by – uh, fall sampling. A lot of people that I say, no, you need to do spring. It's more consistent. Your pHs will be a little more consistent. Your K values will be a little more consistent. 
I say just have a reason for doing what you're doing. On my own stuff, I like to pull in the fall as soon as the crop's out. I feel like that should be giving me a pretty good opportunity to see my crop before my nutrients have been flushed back in, left over from stocks, from rain, maybe at not a really great point in, in the nutrient cycle's life. So I feel like if I can get it where I'm comfortable with it in September or October, then in July, if I don't have irrigation and I can't control rain, I'm putting myself in the best position that I can to succeed. And I would encourage everyone else to do the same thing. If just find your why, know what, why you're doing it, that's more important. You're going to find really, really smart people that will argue both ways. Just do what you think is what you're comfortable with, what you think is right. Um, find what works for you. Maybe something works in your schedule better. If you're going to do a bunch of tillage, I think you're better to pull soil samples before you do that tillage. Um, you get rid of some air pockets. You're a more consistent depth. I just think you're going to get more consistent results over a longer period of time. And for the amount of dollars we base off those, that soil sample, you want it as correct as possible. Um, I just think that's good business. You know, it's, it makes sense to me to do it that way. You know, you were talking about uh, running different uh, population trials and and trying to figure out which one works the best on sand to, to some of your heavier soil. And one of the interesting things, I know you showed me a uh, one of your hybrid maps from last year uh, within Field View, and uh, and I think it was like every pass or every two passes, you were changing the population to see how that uh, that trial went across that entire field. Um, any. Any outlook on uh, doing some of those trials again this year? Yeah, so I always like to run trials. And as a rule on dry land, I think we as a farmer, at least in the Midwest or at least in our area, maybe I don't want to generalize too much there, still plan a little too thick in my opinion. Um, there's a lot of times that if we're water limited, even if it's not water, you, we just we feed all these stalks and leaves. I want to feed ears. You know, I, I, I want to get to the – eight or nine bushels for every thousand kernels planted is your bottom line. You know, that's the, so I think we can make better use of our resources, but there sure still seems to be hybrids that do respond to better, higher populations, not better, but higher. And same way, maybe the better soil types, the more water holding capacity, the more nutrient holding capacity, they can handle a little more plant density as well. But last year we got into a low pocket where we were just extremely dry, June and July, and I had, for the first time ever, almost a linear curve where every 3,000 population I dropped, my yield kept going up. So I, I was saving dollars on my application, on my seeds cost. I was making more dollars on the yield sign. That doesn't happen regularly, you know, but it kind of starts to give you your areas of your field where, hey, something to think about, you know, 26,000 may not only cost less money to put in than 32 you may be yielding more. It's the old, before we had clutches and a lot of this stuff, it's the where you'd plant into your end rows and you'd have that row or two where you'd have 65,000 population. Those two rows would almost always fall over. And I can see that happen a lot at 36 or 38,000 if the soil can't support it. So it's, again, I, I don't, not saying that works on everybody's farm. I think it's good for people to go try and learn and see what does work on your farm. Have you ever, uh, have you ever pulled into the wrong field and sampled the wrong field? I've pulled into the wrong field. I have not sampled the wrong field. I have a guy that helps me, and this fall he called me one day, and he said, man, this map is not right. I am." He was explaining to me where he was, and he's in the field, and I started laughing. I said, if you were going east and you turned left, you are now going north. He said, yeah. I said, that map is on the southeast side of the road. <laughs> he said, yeah. And after a while, he started laughing and realized that he had just pulled a half a field wrong. And so I laughed. I called. I knew whose field it was. So I called him and said, hey, I don't know if you're pulling soil samples or not, but <laughs> we've already got half of it done. There's no reason to dump them out. So I just dropped him off to him and told him if he wanted the map, he could have it. Most people are really, you know, I think there's a lot of times that it seems like there's, I don't know about a standoff, but there's between a business and a farmer, you know, a, a lot of farmers, they want knowledge. They want people to be helping them and to ask questions and to, to challenge the status quo. Um, I think it's something we just need to get better about as an industry on, on both sides, the farmers, the consulting side, the retailer side. We're all trying to learn together. And the, the smartest people I've come across in my life are people that ask lots of questions, not that have lots of answers. 
One of the fascinating things to me right now is the use of social media within the within the ag industry as a whole, uh, and I know you're a part of that, and uh, and you're and you're fairly active. Uh, I know at least on your on your Twitter. So how has how is using Twitter and and being able to connect with farmers all over the place? How has that you know kind of changed your the, the way that you interact with people and the the, the differences and decisions that it's made? Uh, how does social media affect you just within ag? Yeah, so it's been quite the change. I first joined Twitter, I think, in 2014 or 15, and I didn't understand it at all. So after about a week, <laughs> I just quit on it for about a year or two. And then I came back, and I found some interesting people to follow. Um, and I would say most of the people I follow, 95-plus percent, I don't know, never met in person. Uh, I've met some of them in person now, you know, after following. But the amount of information you can learn from other people in just a short amount of time is incredible. Not just like you were asking about technology. It's not just what's coming. You have people that, hey, they've dipped their toe in this water. They can tell you, maybe they can't tell you what does or doesn't work, but they can tell you their experience with it. And the toughest part to me in farming is we get, we're not in Hawaii or South America. We get one growing season. We get one shot at this to learn something about a crop. So being optimistic, I get 45, 50 tries at learning something. Well, if I can take and go ahead and make my view exponential by adding other people, especially people after a while, you really kind of start to trust and think, you know, they're doing a good job. You can really start to add uh, to your operation, things to try, things to do, questions to ask. That's always the biggest one, I think, is find people who ask really good questions. They're super interesting people. Um, It's it's funny because my dad is, is, uh, he's 60. He just turned 60. He is not uh, technology savvy at all. Very, very, very little. But since I've got him on a computer now, it's kind of funny because he'll get on new ag talk quite a little bit, which I don't get on a lot. Very rarely, maybe never. And he never gets on Twitter. And I think he gets tired of me talking about people all, oh, such and such is doing this or this personality is doing that. And I get tired of him going, oh, this guy on ag talk. And I'll say, you don't even know who these people are. And he said, well, you don't know who these people are either. It's it's kind of funny that in 2019, social media has impacted both of our lives, you know. I mean, to a lot of degrees, we both go to both of these places for information, to, like I said, to learn from other people. There's, there's some really sharp people that if you're just willing to listen, you can pick up a lot of information from. Yeah, it is fascinating how farmers are are utilizing you know multiple different types of platforms, right? Uh, yep. Social platforms, whether it is a, a forum on a website or whether it's uh, Twitter or however it is, but uh, just connecting. I, I find that just you know it's been pretty interesting to see agriculture just kind of move over to that. Uh, I haven't got my old man on Twitter yet, so uh, he's uh, he, he's getting close, but uh, I, I can see that he, I, he did get a drone, though. I see, so he's he's not he's always been a little tech savvy. He's not gonna not do something just because he he'll, he'll try. No, absolutely, no, no. Dad's always been uh, very forward thinking, yeah. and uh, now it's been fun to to fly that drone around and uh, kind of you know scout some of our fields yeah. and be able to see some of the field health uh, throughout the year as well. So. Uh, plus, I get a drone to play with, yeah, so exactly. that was really cool. So I kind of get some fringe benefits there. Yeah, so. that's that's where I always wish my dad was a little more tech savvy, so he would buy some of this stuff so I can just take his. And now if I buy it, he just wants me to do his stuff for him. He's <laughs> like, oh, hey, that's kind of cool. Want to go do these fields or do this? And uh, that's kind of funny. We just – the older I get, the more similar we get on thoughts and patterns. And even though we are very different people, um, it just – it's awesome. I mean – I don't think there's a better spot than ag for that. You can meet people with engineering backgrounds, with uh, biology backgrounds, with microbiology. There's all these things to talk about. And you can find your sector where you fit in and talk to people. I think it's a little more fun to be the question asker. Maybe not the naysayer all the time, but be the person that stands out a little bit. Ask a question. You know, it's okay to agree with somebody, but challenge a thought or challenge a a process. That's to me. That's how you learn. That's how you get better. That's that's how we all get better. Is if you know exactly what you're doing, you're so much a, far ahead of me or anyone else. That I think it's good sometimes to take something you don't agree with and argue for it against someone who agrees with it and see what you can learn from it.
I can I can agree that that you're good at uh, at asking questions and sometimes arguing late on late into the night. So yeah, I think yeah, we've had a, yeah. had a few late night arguments that uh, you know, some of them may even still be outstanding. So yeah. I don't know if we've even we, we've gotten to the bottom of all of them. Well, <laughs> you can't solve all the world's problems in one evening. Sometimes you just got to do it again. <laughs> That's true. Uh, hopefully, we'll have uh, plenty of good nights to do that. So yep. so Brian, you know, talking about Twitter, uh, you know, there may be listeners out there that want to want to follow you and and see what you have to say and uh, and the questions that you're asking. And uh, and the folks that you're connecting with as well, uh, how do how do listeners connect with you? Uh, my handle is at Brian Boak. That's B R Y A N B O O C K. Um, and Twitter's mainly what I'm on. I'm on Facebook. I just don't use it very much. And the rest of the social medias, I, I just don't don't subscribe to. So Twitter's kind of it. Well, Brian, we have uh, we have talked about a lot of different topics here today, uh, from everything from how difficult 2018 was in the fall, the uh, interesting weather that we've had uh, here into into the winter, uh, and and how that's going to impact a lot of the decisions, uh, and even had a little discussion about social media. So uh, I appreciate you know you coming in, you sharing your your expertise, your insights, and uh, and your thoughts with us here, and uh, it's just been a great time. So so yeah, thank thanks you. a bunch. I really appreciate it. And I'd like to thank everybody uh, for joining us here and listening to us today. And remember, Around the Farm is brought to you by Climate Field View. And don't miss any episodes. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcast at. And we'll see you around the farm.